Welcome back everyone to Shall Make, Shall Be. Our next speaker is Sean Pierre, whose project deals with the Fifth Amendment. Sean Pierre is a visiting assistant arts professor at the NYU Game Center and game designer working to combine new forms of play with different types of media. His work includes voice controlled adventure games, social deduction SMS games, and physical games where players capture others in nets. In the past, Sean has created and worked on crowd-based interactive activities, including installments at Graceland, as well as games for major sporting events. As a member and project director of Philly Game Mechanics, Sean works to build a community where local creators meet new people and share their creative work. Friends, please welcome Sean Pierre. Hi, everybody. Uh, once again, uh, my name is Sean Pierre. Yes, I am a visiting assistant director for professor at NYU, so I'm hanging out at the NYU Game Center. And um, as I just said, I also help and organize a group called Philly Game Mechanics, uh, which as the name suggests, is based out of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And our goal is to foster the development scene in Philadelphia, uh, supporting both hobbyists and independent developers by having meetups and game jams, social gatherings, which you know most have mostly been virtual. I'm, I am also a game designer, of course, working on a bunch of games, uh, digital, physical, tabletop, and maybe an outside of bread, um, outside of games, excuse me, I like to make bread every once in a while. Yeah, but uh, back to games. You know, I mentioned I'm, I'm a bit all over the place with the types of games I make. Um, so this is a bit about me. Um, I'm making a lot of digital games now, but I also make live interaction games. Um, I don't have any photos of this because normally when I play the game, I'm always running things from a computer, but I had a version of Werewolf called Urban Werewolf, where I ran at an event called, called Come Out and Play in 2015 in, um, in Brooklyn. Uh, it's a version of the game Werewolf and it's played via SMS with an automated moderator. So uh, I, I'll talk a little bit more about how it works. Uh, when the game starts, you receive a phone call letting you know that um, you were a villager or a werewolf, while everyone else receives a text message with a role and a four digit code. So you can be the florist, you could be the doctor, you could be the carpenter, and or your code, um, and your code could be 3483. Uh, during the day phase, you receive a job, uh, and it was the job was to find someone else. So if I was a florist, I would find the carpenter, I would get their four-digit code and text it to the system. Um, so people would be going around asking each other for their secret codes, texting them to the system. Uh, if I text once correctly, that counts as one text done. Um, everyone as a group needs to complete 12 or else a dojo is randomly eliminated. And then of course, during the night phase, you have a person who is the wolf who needs to discreetly send a text message with someone's code to the moderator. And then day phase comes about, that person is eliminated, the community makes their accusations, guesses, et cetera. Uh, then everyone sends the code for the person they want to eliminate as with traditional werewolf. And just like with traditional werewolf, the game ends when the werewolf is eliminated or the number of wolves and villagers are equal. Another thing that I worked on in the past, uh, which kind of combines some real space and digital space, um, is a game I worked on for the digital component of the Philadelphia Fringe Festival. I made a game called Known Sender, um, and it was a narrative game based in Twine. Twine is a tool that is primarily used to make narrative experiences. So uh, with this game, you start off home alone one evening watching TV and checking your email. And then eventually you get an email from a friend who asks you for your phone number. Uh, but your real life cell phone number. So you enter your number, you send it to your friend. Um, and after that, the game becomes a slight horror mystery style game where you're receiving text messages and phone calls. And the only way to advance on screen is to respond to these text messages and calls. So you're partially playing on your computer, uh, but you're also playing on your phone using basic SMS. So yeah, my work, it's kind of a bit all over the place. Uh, for this exhibition, I am working on a game called Blank versus Blank. Um, it's called Blank versus Blank because when people play, I want them to add their names to uh, the blank spots, their actual blanks, not the word blank. So if I were playing a friend named Amber, the name of the game would be a uh, set of blank versus blank. It's Amber versus Sean. Um, each time you play, it becomes a unique case special to you and the person you're playing with. So once again, I was tasked with making something based on the Fifth Amendment. Um, and as with a bunch of other amendments, it's tied up uh, with a bunch of different things. Okay, so 
We have uh, the Fifth Amendment is no person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime unless on a uh, precedent or indictment of a grand jury, except in cases arising in the land or naval forces or in the militia when in actual service in times of war or public danger. Uh, nor shall any person be subject for the same offense to be twice put in jeopardy of life or limb, nor shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself, nor be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of war, uh, law, um, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. Okay, so I think to properly understand where I'm working with the game, we need to take a look at all the pieces of the Fifth Amendment. Uh, probably the most famous one, uh, part of it, is the part about self-incrimination. You know, this is where you see or hear people saying, I plead the fifth in movies or on TV shows or with your friends for fun, right? You know, they're referring to this amendment. Uh, it does protect you from incriminating yourself uh, through testimony. And tied up all in there, you have something called the Miranda warnings, which is also pretty popular. Uh, this is when you hear someone say, you know, freedom, freedom the rights. And then someone says, you have the right to remain silent or anything you say can be, um, say, anything you say can be used against you in a court of law. Those are your Miranda warnings or Miranda rights. Um, then after that, we also have a uh, double jeopardy. Um, not as much fun as a game show, but uh, if you went through the whole process of uh, where you were convicted um, or acquitted for a crime, you can't be prosecuted for a second uh, time. There's a whole bunch of um, if, ands, or buts in there, but that's the general thing. Um, and then there are some less popular parts of it. Um, one um, referring relating to the grand jury and the other one relating to due process um, and eminent domain. Um, for the grand jury um, and due process, um, basically the government, they need to act according to the legal rules. They can't violate any proceedings and basically need to be fair. Um, and then the takings, uh, takings clause, which is the whole eminent domain. Uh, the government can't take private property without just compensation. Uh, the weird thing here is probably what does just, just compensation mean? But you know, I'm not a lawyer, so don't ask me to go into more detail about what counts as property and what is just and whether you can give someone like a big bag of cash. Um, so I, um, I wanted to try and make my uh, game be as proper as possible or use the parts of the amendment you know, as, as close as possible. Uh, most of us were able to speak to a lawyer actually about our sci uh, specific amendments and how they were used in the past, you know, and what would happen maybe in specific cases. Uh, I had a very difficult time finding a case that involved all the pieces of the Fifth Amendment um, and trying to get all of this into the game felt a bit unnatural. Uh, but trying to make the game for the legal system, uh, yeah, that was taking away from some of the fun of the game. So, like I said, there are a bunch of moving parts in this amendment, like I'm sure everyone else. Uh, but for my game, I'm focusing on double jeopardy information and the Miranda works. So this is how the, the game works. And I'll show you some images of that. So um, it's a two player game. One person starts as the suspect, the other plays as the investigator. The goal um, for the investigator is to figure out the crime that the suspect committed from illicit crimes. The suspect, their job is to get the investigator to pick the wrong crime, you know, a crime that they already committed, uh, one they've already been through the whole legal system for. If the investigator picks the wrong crime, the game is over because of the double jeopardy clause and the suspect wins. Uh, the suspect loses if the investigator picks the correct uh, crime. So a bunch of crimes are placed on a table face up and um, and the suspect picks two crimes, one to be the double jeopardy crime and one to be the real crime. Um, after they pick those, they write it down on an envelope, um, on a piece of paper and they put that inside an envelope and they put that aside to be looked at later on. Um, after that, the two players, um, is, sorry, these are the crime cards, and this is the envelope that everything goes in. Um, after that, the two players draw cards to decide on categories and information about each category. Uh, both players know what categories are chosen, uh, but only the suspect knows the answers to these specific categories. Now, all of these cards are placed in the special suspect folder, um, which only the suspect can use. There are a bunch of slots in the folder. It's confidential, so I can't open it. I'm sorry. Uh, these cards, uh, this is information that's all about the suspect. So we have specific categories for favorite movie and favorite, um, maybe favorite movie genre and 
hometown um, and uh, favorite hobby. And the cards, um, and they're also cards that uh, don't have really uh, specific answers. So you can have categories like oldest possession or least favorite gift or last item held. So for these sections, uh, the less specific ones, the answers are all nouns like telephone or a water bottle. Both of those can be, you know, fit the category of last item held. So all of these cards are related to the crimes that were actually placed on the table. Um, some of them related to multiple crimes. While the suspect is filling the folder, the investigator is writing the names of the categories on the note sheet. Um, and then to make all of this official, the two players, they signed um, this document. Um, the legal, uh, part of it is underneath inside the folder. Um, afterwards, the two players, um, they choose a set of what I'm calling the Miranda rights. They alternate picking a rule starting with the suspect. Uh, these are special rules that can help or hurt the player. So they need to choose wisely and choose rules at the right time. Okay, so once the setup is done, we move to the question and answer phase. Uh, during each phase, uh, the investigator is allowed to ask three questions about specific categories. Uh, they can be straightforward, uh, such as, tell me about your favorite hobby, or they can ask for more, more detail, like, have you ever cried while watching your favorite movie genre? Why and why not? You know, if the suspect ever feels uncomfortable, about um, answering a question, maybe it's getting too close to something that might reveal the crime, uh, they can plead the fifth. So this is where you get to use the self-incrimination part, uh, but only a limited number of times. You can't just say it whenever you want. Uh, uh, of course, they can do this just to throw the investigator off. It's all part of the game. Uh, the suspect can then answer these questions truthfully or they can lie. And you may think that it's pretty easy to fool the investigator by just lying, but after the third question, the investigator gets to uh, guess how many of the suspect's questions uh, were lies and how many, uh, I'm sorry, how many of the suspect's answers were lies or the truth. Uh, if the investigator gets that part right, they can gather more information on what you specifically lied about and what you specifically told the truth. Um, investigators getting from the parts of the uh, the Depression Amendment, you know, I was able to uh, map out self-incrimination and double jeopardy without straying uh, far from the original deal too much. Uh, the one I took the most liberties, I think, with was the Miranda warnings. Uh, instead of them being something set up by law in the game, it's something that the two players need to agree on. But once they do, they'll need to make sure that they know their rights and when they can apply. In the, the, I guess the non-game real world, uh, things can wind up poorly you know, if you forget your rights or someone forgets your rights. Uh, I'm looking forward like, to this whole exhibition. And what I'm really looking forward to is the dynamics of watching people play. Um, and I'm really, really interested in seeing what happens when two play people who know each other really well start to play. Because the people you know well, you get to know their tells when they tell a lie or at least maybe you think you do. And then during the game, you're obsessing over them, doing small things like tapping their fingers when they answer certain questions. You know, and I, I want the suspect to do their best to weave a web of deceptions, but one that I guess I'm considering fragile because if they're not paying attention or if they're careless, the investigator will, I guess, continue with the web thing, will pull on a thread and eventually the entire web of lies will collapse. Um, I guess I can finish by saying it's funny because Working on this is, um, when I was working on this and something else, I, I thought my days of working on games about the deception and manipulation were over, but then this entire game is about leading people on and gathering information. And I'm a terrible liar myself and I get super guilty over uh, any time a lie that I tell. So anytime I try and play this game, I try and be as truthful as possible, which means I'm terrible and I lose. Uh, so. The overall process for this has been really interesting, um, and I'm really looking forward to seeing what emerges when people play together. Uh, that is it. Thank you.